something happening here but what it is ain't exactly clear Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Last week I had the opportunity to spend a few days in Miami getting more familiar with Sony's A6300, a camera that after just a very short time with back last month in New York, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get. But it was also an opportunity to spend more time with the first two lenses in their new G Master line, the 85mm f1.4 and their 24-70 f2.8. But the idea that I could have that much time with this gear and really get into it made me a little bit nuts because I thought to myself if the A6300 autofocus system really is the fastest in the world and if people who I respect are getting faster focus times on a Sony A7R2 with native Canon glass than native Canon bodies well then I ought to be able to do that with the A6300 so yeah, I did this. I brought down the legendary 300mm f2.8 IS USM Mark II Canon, one of the most beautiful and expensive telephotos out there, six grand a pop. And I made it. In this instance, I'm just showing it to you on my A6000. I don't have the 6300 yet because it's not shipping via a calm light adapter. So this is what I brought down with me. And, uh, you'll see some of the results. Now, that wasn't the only thing that I was going to bring down with me. I brought down this little guy, the Zeiss Tuit 12mm f2.8. Now, the thing about the Tuit is that it hasn't been a particularly popular branch of the Zeiss lens tree. This is E, not FE, so it's a crop sensor lens, which I like because that makes it small and lightweight. And frankly, I didn't expect that I would like it that much. The flip side is, I love it. And I'm going to show you why. So here's the thing, no matter what lens I put on the A6300, I love the imagery coming back at me. Now, when it comes to movies, my instinct tells me that it's the move from 1080p to 4K which is really most responsible for the bump and sharpness rather than trying to get that last 10 tenth out of the ultimate performing lens. Although, that 85mm 1.4 G Master, oh my god. God. When it comes to still images, I'm thinking that if you have to pixel peep, if that's what you want to do, then the image has already failed. Here's what I'll sum it up with. All of these lenses, in combination with the A6300, inspired me. Take a look and draw your own conclusions. <laughs>
6300 is thicker and heavier than the A6000. And I'm delighted to tell you that it allows the A6300 to be a legitimate platform for geared Cine lenses. That's a big deal. By adding a jack for the mic, they've actually increased the size of the port cover. And in doing that had an unintended consequence for me. My L bracket for the A6000 doesn't quite fit the 6300. And this turns out to be critical because I rely on the really right stuff L bracket to serve as a platform for an HDMI cable. And without that clamp, micro HDMI port has a bad connection. The last time I used the Sony UWP D11 wireless mic kit, a sharp-eared viewer pointed out to me that there was a lot of hiss, and I wasn't quite sure why. Now I think I know why. When you use the UWP D11 with multi-interface shoe, the audio gain is automatic. Can't control it. In the 6300, it's the same thing unless you run a cable from the wireless receiver to the mic jack. What I did is I took a, a coffee table book, put it on a coffee table, and then with just one light pretty far away, ran up through the ISOs, culminating in 25,600 for the A6300 and the A7R2. Now, I'm not pixel peeping, I'm just looking at the screen, and I am not likely to watch anything on a screen much bigger than 27 inches, except when I put it up on my 55 inch flat screen TV. So again, no pixel peep. But here's the thing that's blowing my mind, and you can make your own judgments. And in fact, I'd love to hear from you uh, if you have a different point of view. What I see is that the two cameras look pretty darn similar, all the way up to 25,600. Now, I thought I was being smart because I had black and I had white, and they represent different uh, opportunities for noise artifacts. And to me, it looks like I could go right up to 25,600 and find it usable. So maybe I have to redo this test, but this is fascinating to me. I'd love to hear what you think. I've never done a rolling shutter test because any rolling shutter test I've ever seen the person doing it has yanked that camera from left to right with a pan I would never do. But there have been times when I've filmed, for example, a street scene and a bus has come through it and it looks a little bit odd. Or I've been in a moving car and telephone posts looked a little bit odd. So here I was on the balcony uh, taking a shot and I noticed a boat on my right side. So I quickly panned the camera to the right not for the pan, but just to see if I could capture footage of the boat. And that's when I saw this rolling shutter. Does it make a big difference to me? No. Might it make a big difference to you? It could. That's why high-end cameras have global shutters. Over the course of three or four days, I had a great deal of fun, and I learned a great deal about the gear. The most important things, though, were ultimately not about the gear at all. It was about the people. It was about the recognition that always it's more a function of the skill, passion, and creativity we bring to image making than the gear itself. Although the gear is pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, I want to share with you four different philosophical musings in quick order. One, I want to talk about Kondo. This is the concept that Sony says inspires what it's doing in its consumer digital imaging business. And roughly translated, it means inspiring and satisfying one's curiosity, or to put a finer spin on it emotional engagement. And wow, they're doing that. I am so excited by some of the images that I captured there. And you've seen a number of them. The second concept that I want to share with you is that of wabi-sabi. Roughly translated, amounts to 
beauty in imperfection. No camera gets it all right. Sony didn't get it all right. There are things that need to be evolved. There are things with every camera manufacturer that need to be involved. But in what they've accomplished in the A6300 and the first two G Master lenses, I see beauty. I also saw beauty in the paint chips on the murals down in Miami, which was really very, very exciting. The third concept that I want to share with you is Jinba Itai. This concept I first learned about many years ago when Mazda introduced the Miata, their roadster. And again, roughly translated, it means unity of rider and horse. I think this is an area for Sony to focus on going forward because the strength of their lineup is also, like anything else, its weakness. There are so many things that these cameras can do. There are so many choices and tweaks that can be made that they can actually stand between you and the image or the footage you're trying to capture. I've written about this before, the notion of a seamless experience. And I think this would be well worth Sony's time to spend effort with. The last concept is actually not a concept at all. It's a fable uh, known as Zeno's Paradox, in particular, the paradox of the tortoise and Achilles. Zeno was a Greek philosopher who said, look, if you are Achilles and you give the tortoise a head start in a race, then at the rate of closing the distance by half with each stride, you'll never actually beat the tortoise. And so it is with camera gear. The goal keeps moving. Six months ago, before I'd played with a Sony FS5, this would have been it, right? It would have been it. If I'd played with this before I'd played with an FS7, it would have been it. But now I want 10-bit output. If it has to come through the HDMI port, that's fine, but I want 10 bits. I want that electronic variable neutral density filter inside this camera that comes on the FS5. I want an app that gives me complete control of still and movie functions through an iPhone. In fact, you can argue that Zeno's paradox should include another animal because in even suggesting these things, I'm feeling pretty piggy. Anyway, I have a lot more to learn with the camera. I'm going to be sharing with you details on how to use the autofocus going uh, forward because it's really critical. And I will get a better handle on why it is that although I was capable of getting tremendous imagery with that Canon 300 millimeter lens, it was too much of a hit and miss to use on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. See you soon. And yes, I've got it. I remember I'm developing the habit. If you like what you saw here, please remember to subscribe below. I really love this camera.